The history of India is a subject matter of interest and debate. Unfortunately, the debate over whether Indian history needs to be rewritten often becomes a shallow, social media driven political debate. What is forgotten in such a social media debate is the fundamental question of whether the existing narration of Indian history is flawed. Republic Media Network believes that freedom fighters from various strands of both the Hindu right as well as the Marxist left have been disregarded in the narration of Indian history. Our network also believes that individuals and legends like Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose who posed a challenge to Nehruvian supremacy within the Congress and whose approach to the struggle for independence was different have been cut out from Indian history. In our attempt to rekindle a discussion on presenting the true history of India, we are featuring the multifaceted Sanjeev Sanyal whose book on Indian revolutionaries is making waves even before its release. Welcome ladies and gentlemen to yet another episode of our restarted series, uh, The Nation Wants to Know. And today uh, I have on the first episode of The Nation Wants to Know in 2023, I have with me uh, one of India's finest economists, one of India's finest authors, historians, speakers, and for me, one of my best friends, Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> no, no. And I want to begin with the disclosures. We go back a really, 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 really long way. We do, to <laughs> Delhi University of the early 90s. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, who can forget that? Who can forget that? And, and also at Oxford, where you were doing your, uh, where you were doing your uh, degree, uh, postgraduate degree, and I was doing my master's. So. We go back more than 25 years. Absolutely. Wonderful to see you again. Great and to I'm have so you. I'm so happy to see you doing well and, uh, every, and having such a following of your own and performing so many roles both in the service of the nation as well as professionally. So Thank you. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Now viewers, I, I will come straight to the point. And I do believe, I do believe, viewers, this is a book that, first of all, it's not just a normal plug, but I'm saying this because I believe in it. I believe that this book is something which every, everybody, their parents and their children should read. It's a book called Revolutionaries, The Other Side, The Other Story of How India Won Its Freedom. And the context setting for this is simple. The context setting is Sanjeev and I'd say this that we keep talking about when are we going to rewrite our history? When are our children going to, uh, going to see the real history of India put before them? When will we see the truth being put out? When will we see others who have not been recognized being put out? I believe we don't really need to wait for, a, wait for our school textbooks to be changed because that can't be the only source of our knowledge and information. And I think your book is a big contribution in that. Why do you call it the other side of how India won its freedom? Well, because I think there is another story to how India won its freedom. It was not granted its freedom. It grabbed its freedom. Mm. And it, it was not only through the uh, non-violent movement. There was, throughout the British occupation, a um, armed resistance to the British. This happened right from the beginning with the Marathas and Sikhs and so on. But in the 20th century, with the revolutionaries, you see this really strong armed resistance, which is not just within India, but sp spanning across the world from California to Persia to Japan. There's this massive network that for half a century kept up uh, this resistance. So I think this story needs to be told. Sadly, it is barely mentioned in our textbooks. Now, can I just tell you what the popular perception of this is? Not popular, maybe flawed, but, but the view has been, Sanjeev, that, oh, okay, there were a few revolutionaries. There were a few people who didn't believe with the moderates. The moderates were the good guys. The revolutionaries were these uh, unpredictable lot of people. And extremists. Also, huh? Extremists. Extremists is the word. Mm -hmm. And also very loosely congregated. There's like There's no real intellectual, philosophical, or organizational link between any of them. So before we go into the details of that, is that perception true? So this is exactly what I'm trying to uh, challenge. You see, it's, these events are quite recent. I mean, some of it is within uh, living memory. So it's not the case that the likes of Raj Bihari Bose or Sachindranath Sanyal or uh, Sri Aurobindo or Savarkar have been forgotten. They've not been forgotten. They are well-known names. But you get the impression that, you know, whatever Bhagat Singh may have done or Netaji may have done is an individual act of bravery. Peripheral rule. Yeah, some peripheral thing. There was no grander strategy and so on. That's not the case. All these people knew each other. And this effort has been going on. So, for example, the INA, 
is not the first attempt to cause a revolt in the uh, British Indian Army. In the First World War also, Raj Bihari Bose and Sachindranath Sanyal tried to cause such an exact same revolt uh, called the Gadar Revolt. It failed, it's a different matter, but it wasn't the first attempt. And same Raj Bihari Bose then in the Second World War actually sets up the INA. It's not Netaji who set up the INA, it is Raj Bihari Bose who set it up. It was his second attempt. And then you have the great naval revolt of 1946, same thing, basically a revolt in the British armed forces. This was the key thing that the revolutionaries were trying to do. Since you mentioned the naval re revolt, you also mentioned that you actually got to know about it in your 20s. Absolutely. So you never knew about it till college and probably I never did as well. And you researched it independently on your own and that's the flawed history that we've been reading all this while. So I take you to page 8 of your book. My first question to you is emanating from your book, and by the way, marvelous introduction out here. You know, on the role of non violence in achieving our freedom, was the role of non violence in achieving India's independence overplayed? to be made to look like it's the only theme and emanating from that a follow-up question where you can deal with both together is there an opposition or an embarrassment about the role of armed resistance in achieving our freedom so an armed resistance is the most natural of things almost every other country in the world employed it to gain freedom there's so nothing very unique to us. The problem is that the story that we are told in official sources is that somehow this uh, movement in India for gaining freedom was uniquely non-violent. Mm -hmm. Now I'm challenging that. Now I'm not saying that the non-violent movement did not have a role. It did have a role. But the fact of the matter is there was also this other movement which was a very large movement which by the way didn't just involve the revolutionary networks themselves but had links to for example peasant movements like the Eka movement or the tribal revolts for example by um, Aluri Sitaramaya Raju now made famous by RRR. So there were all these other movements that were going on which were interconnected with each other and they went on for a very long time um, as, as, and as I said culminating of course in the naval revolt of uh, 1946 but you know uh, with major revolts like the Chittagong armory uh, raid and other uh, sort of uh, incidents which continuously happened so it's not something that just happened in one spark. But my question was was the role of non-violence overplayed? Absolutely. And, and in why, fact, why was it overplayed? Because we've all, we've all been brought up with that ideal. Well, that, you know, if, you, if you, someone slaps you on one cheek, you must turn the other cheek and get slapped on all the cheeks till the other side tires out and then you will have a moral victory over them. And my question to you was that generations of Indians, you and me, have grown up feeling that all that, all that brought us was a passive, non-violent resistance. Now, was that overplayed? Absolutely overplayed. And there are many reasons for this. By whom and why? Well, first of all, you see, the revolutionaries were a big movement. They were even big inside the Congress. Big enough that uh, Netaji was able to defeat the Gandhians in an open election within the Congress. But what happens at independence is that most of these big leaders of the uh, revolutionary movement uh, have essentially been killed or they have died from natural causes in a few cases. Some have been sent to the gallows and so on. So the revolutionaries don't have any leadership left. So when India becomes free, it is essentially uh, comes to be ruled by one faction of the Congress party and perhaps human, uh, 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 they are human and they overplay their uh, own role. But here is where I think they really went wrong. They deliberately go out there and suppress alternative narratives. One example of that is R.C. Majumdar, perhaps the greatest historian India has uh, produced in modern times. And he is simply pushed aside deliberately for bringing up other narratives of our freedom struggle. You write here that despite their enormous contribution, virtually none of their important leaders of the revolutionary movement would have lived to see India gain independence. Men, many of them killed in gunfights, hanged from the gallows or dying in prison. Aurobindo Ghosh and Vinayak Savarkar, the only two surviving senior leaders, had drifted away from the movement decades earlier. Now, you also follow up by saying that Sachindranath Sanyal, who by the way is your grand uncle, and that's a link, it's a disclosure, he comes from a fantastic lineage, Sachindranath Sanyal, in the 1920s had a premonition that this would happen. Yes, 
he he felt that the role of all these leaders many of whom unfortunately never were were there on august 15 1947 in his book he writes would be sidelined and he writes in his book and i'll quote this and i'll i want you to talk about it he says that the reason for writing his book according to you was not merely to inspire contemporary revolutionaries but also to leave behind a personal testimony for future generations and sachindranath sanyal says i am writing this book so that in future a few chapters of indian history can be correctly written so in the 1920s in the 1920s there was a sense growing that all these revolutionaries would be lost in terms of they saw independence coming but they felt that their contribution would be sidelined absolutely why was it so why why was there the cynicism and pessimism growing so i don't know why he had this pre- premonition but he turned out to be absolutely right i mean he himself died in 1942 um but just, he wrote uh, in the 20s he wrote this in the 20s uh, but what is happening here is i think he has this premonition that many of his contemporaries are just going to be killed himself is that the reason uh, or is that is it that the congress party at that time or the quote unquote the 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 loyalists loyalists to the british empire within the congress party were sidelining this group well, this or, or f- this friction within the congress is there right from the beginning we call it the extremists versus moderates in our textbooks but in fact i completely disagree they, with that, they, with they, that. They, i i think yeah. we should not use that phrase i love the phrase uh, nationalist versus loyalist yes club. that's what the revolutionaries called um, called it themselves yeah now this friction is always there and of course the revolutionaries have this premonition that they might be sidelined uh, afterward so they write this but do remember that when they are writing uh, these things uh, much of what they are writing is also underground so much of their literature you have to understand is being distributed in large numbers but as underground literature savarkar's book is brought to india in handwritten thing and then later reprinted so the they are trying to tell their story but through underground literature so th- this is also one of the reasons that uh, sort of this premonition may have uh, existed in their minds I, my other question to you is uh, who inspired the revolutionaries more indian figures or uh, global events because you write at at one point you write that in this revolution of ideas uh, obviously there were various influences uh if there's someone watching this interview tonight and the question from them goes to you were indian figures like chatrapati shivaji uh guru gobind singh inspiring the revolutionaries more in their uh in their armed resistance or was it global events like like for example the the success of marxism uh you know it, and and its evident popularity through the 1920s and 30s we cannot undermine the the contribution of marxist philosophy or perhaps irish nationalism uh which was also sort of very yes. prevalent in that period absolutely so which ha- was which had a greater influence well the revolutionaries were characters of their own time so of course they were impacted by many things uh, the irish the uh, communism uh, the rise of japan by the way after 1905 uh, def- uh, when they defeated the russians so there were many external influences uh, garibaldi and mazzini were italian nationalists and so on but a very important inspiration was also the long history of india's resistance to foreign uh, occupation and yes. so they rana pratap shivaji and of course hindu revivalism is an important part of it again today's writers seem to be many often tend to be embarrassed by this but the fact is hindu revivalism was a very important part of how they saw themselves the initiation rites for example are all about holding the geeta in one hand a revolver in the other hand and making oaths to a form of durga or bhavani or kali so you can see uh, hinduism particularly the shakti strand of hinduism having a deep influence on the way uh, many of these revolutionaries uh, saw themselves this is not to suggest that they were uh, bigots there were non hindus also in this for example ashfaqullah uh, khan was a great revolutionary uh, you have uh, madam bhika ji kama also a part of that movement so there are others as well but you cannot deny hindu revivalism and hindu nationalism is an important part so of the story so at the core of it was nationalism absolutely at the core of it was nationalism and i i, I feel uh, again my my knowledge is so uh, so much uh, you know less uh, less uh, has as less depth or 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 uh, 
uh, knowledge as yours, but, but if I may put in my two bits here that we try to draw a Chinese complete divide between say Savarkar, Bhagat Singh or Bhagha Jyotin, right? And is that the right thing to do? Because there was something that connected them. We look at what divides them. We don't talk about what's connecting them. In fact, Savarkar's work on 1857 is quoted by Bhagat Singh. Absolutely. And is a source of inspiration for Bhagat Singh. Absolutely. And it may seem surreal in today's world where there are these complete bipolarities that how could Bhagat Singh be inspired by a work written by, uh, by, by, by Vinayak Savarkar. So my next question is was Savarkar, according to your book, Savarkar and Bhagat Singh and Bhaga Jyotin all part of a connected history. Absolutely. And are we not even writing about that history? And, and have generations of Indians never known about that con those connections? So, so this book is an attempt to try and tell the story because you see what we have done. But answer is, my question on that. So they have, part of they have, they have, what we are trying to do is to see this history from today's ideological uh, lens. But their lens was completely different. I mean, like for example, Bhagat Singh, his guru is Sachindranath Sanyal, who is explicitly anti-Marxist. Yeah. So they have, their linkages are different. Um, you have, of course, the, the Hindu right is a part of the same movement. Yes. Later on from the uh, 20s, but more particularly in the 30s, you have Marxists in there. Uh, you have a large section within the Congress who is allied to the, uh, aligned to the revolutionaries and as I mentioned, Netaji was actually able to defeat the Gandhians inside the Congress. So there is strong linkages between all of these uh, characters and this incidentally is true to this day. So many of the streams of today's uh, uh, politics are derived from this, yeah. this revolutionary uh, period. For example, um, the CPI and the RSP are derived from the Arnishanan Samiti, yeah. as indeed is the RSS, who is also derived from the Arnishanan Samiti. So there are different streams, but they were a part of one big project of armed resistance. And they did have many things uh, interconnected in there. So Swami Vivekanand, inter interestingly, is a huge inspiration across the ideological spectrum. So I think we are not doing justice to this movement by trying to carve them up into small bits and pieces based on, you know, today's ideological debates. Well, I think it's, it's very shallow, isn't it? I mean, um, uh, let me go, let, let's look at the intellectual roots of who inspired who are the inspirational figures who are common to all. And one name which emerges, but which I feel in the context setting of India's freedom struggle, we cannot remove the politics from the, from the, from the cultural revivalism. And I believe that it's very wrong to not talk about the role of Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda, in my view, uh, and you've written about it, I'm so glad, I'd be grateful to you for that, was an inspirational figure. Because, because as, as you write, as you write, and I, I, I want to quote what you write about Swami Vivekananda here, uh, you say that although Swami Vivekananda was not a political figure, his rekindling of civilizational confidence had a huge impact across India and the political spectrum. Virtually all the branches of India's revolutionary movement would come to regard him as an inspirational figure. Absolutely. But then if we are to understand Swami Vivekananda, then we have to go back to Ramakrishna Paramhans. Then we have to go back to, 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 to another key figure of this movement, Rani Rashmoni, you know, who pushed back uh, the, the British establishment Absolutely. at that time. These names are not even known. Uh, in your view, what was the role of Swami Vivekananda and others like him and the whole idea of, a, of, 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 of civilizational confidence in, in, in our history, in our Hindu history, in our Indic history, uh, in, in our freedom struggle. So you had that, I feel that has been totally disregarded now. Yes, because I, as I said... Uh, in I want you to answer this in as much length as you want. So what we are trying to do is to try to secularize and sanitize this history for a certain line of ideological bent. 
Um, so basically what is happening here is that you have here a, a country and a civilization which realizes in the late 19th century that it has been under occupation first by the British but even before that under the Turks and Mughals and so on. And they have been in this continuous state of warfare. So you have the likes of uh, of course, Swami Vivekananda, but others as well, Dayanand Saraswati, you have people like Sri Aurobindo, yes. who are coming out there and saying that, no, you know, we are a great people, we need to stand up for ourselves. Yes. And so, this is the triggering point of this entire uh, movement. Uh, it has impact even on the Congress, by the way, which originally, many people forget, was set up by the British themselves as a safety valve. So it's only with the triggering of the civilizational confidence that even within the Congress you have the Lal Bal Pal trio coming up and beginning to uh, sort of stoke uh, a more aggressive anti-colonial uh, line. Well, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned the Congress being a safety valve, and and that is evident to me with the fact that you know I find it so um, so upsetting that when I was in school we used to he read a paragraph or two about A.O. Hume, yes. whereas we never realized what A.O. Hume was and I feel A.O. Hume was nothing but a plant by the British. Absolutely. And he... A.O. Hume, the Congress entire, the, the Congress was a British experiment. Absolutely. And there were many such experiments. So, for example, A.O. Hume creates this as a safety valve. But, for example, the Gadarites, we, who, who had uh, lots of Sikhs within them and uh, operated to a large extent in places like Canada through the Gurudwaras, they were infiltrated by British intelligence. An uh, agent called Hopkinson was infiltrated the Gurudwaras in uh, Canada uh, uh, as a way of subverting nationalist ideas that were spreading through the uh, network of Gurudwaras. And it's not very surprising that the Khalistan movement uh, uh, actually emerges out of the same Gurudwaras in Canada. To this day, this have, has an impact. So, what I'm trying to say is that if we do not read this history, we do not understand why on earth is Khalistan movement in Canada of all places on? Well, because of Hopkinson. And by the way, Hopkinson was shot dead in the court by a Sikh uh, Gadarite called Meva Singh. Uh, and many of these uh, initial collaborationist uh, groups were, uh, you know, were under tremendous pressure from uh, nationalist Sikhs and Gadarites, etc. Uh, in the initial years and well, we then think, after independence let them be. You think it will ever be possible to write and read a history in this country where we speak the truth, where we say for example Sanjeev that the Congress was set up by the British to contain the, uh, the, 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 uh, the revolutionaries who through their ideas were sparking uh, the birth of a new resistance against the British. And that, uh, will we ever have a textbook which says that A.O. Hume was a British plant, the Congress was a British creation, which is evident from the fact that they put a complete out and out shameless imperialist called W.C. Banerjee as, as their head. And W.C. Banerjee was, was, was an abject imperialist. You know, he, he, he was a loyalist. He was a, he was a complete British loyalist who had no affection. Or, or uh, uh, you know, or he didn't even live in India eventually, and he became a member of the British Parliament. But well, I, well the, so, I, so, so the, the problem with are we are we ready to speak that truth as clearly as we should? Well, actually, the, why don't we? The, the tragedy is that there is more than adequate evidence for this in in their own words. <laughs> but why are we squeamish about it? We are squeamish about it because we say, we tend to think that somehow this has. Uh, we must do this because of today's political debates. No, no, why do we need, why, you, you, you see, the, there, it, there needs to be a resetting here. Absolutely. There needs to be a resetting. See, so, we, you know, we have we, to we, somehow... We have, we, have, we have idolized these people and, and with the greatest of respect, we've idolized Dadabhai Nauroji as a great freedom fighter. Well, to be fair to Dadabhai Nauroji, given the context of the time, he was fairly outspoken for his context. Yeah, but, but, I, but it's uh, all but, relative, but, but yeah. you quote what he said in his presidential address of 1893 where he says, I have never faltered in my faith in the British character and have always believed that the time will come when the sentiments of the British nation and our gracious sovereign proclaimed to us in the great charter of the proclamation of 1858 will be realized. Uh, I can I can argue here that this is embarrassingly servile, as you write yourself. Yes, this yes, is this is embarrassing servility 
uh, you know, and you can say it's a function of the times. He had his limitations, but is it only a function of the times? Well, there is no doubt that there's just painful civility in the language used by the early congressmen. There's no doubt about this. I, in fact, gave this as an example that the most outspoken of them, Dada Bhai Navaroji, even wrote like this. No, no, but then. But, but then, some of the others are significantly worse. No, no, but then when a phrase is put out, hmm. uh, which is common at that point of time, only an expression of grammar hmm. and not an expression of intent by Savarkar in his letter, then Rahul Gandhi keeps quoting it. I mean, I think that uh, the first copy of this book should be presented to Rahul Gandhi, not that he will have the depth to understand it in great detail. Well, at the but, very but, least. But, but, but. At the very you least. You get my point. At the very least, we need to be very clear that there was a large collaboration, uh, cl collaborationist class in India. This collaborationist class definitely tried everything they could to undermine the revolutionary movement. One of the great tragedies of Indian history is that after 1947, after most of the revolutionaries had either been killed, jailed and eliminated, this collaborationist class after independence actually continued to be in power. And many of the intellectuals of post-independence India are actually derived from this collaboration. Amity has been ranked India's number one not-for-profit private, private university for 10 years. With top 10 ranked institutions in management, engineering, biotech, law, masscom, telecom, hospitality, fashion and more. Yet another top ranking for Amity University. You said that Colonel Bull Kumar, he saw the map and said that this is a big deal. As per map, it's a big deal. But the people who are going to go there, the Germans are giving permission to Pakistan. Because since there were some people like us who were aware of what is Siachen Glacier, we knew what it is like. I went to Bela Fondla, Pakistan's helicopter on me. He saw me, I saw him. He went back to him. They were shocked. Hello, Sir. Hello, Sir. Hello, Sir. Hello, Sir. Hello, Sir. Nidhi, you should say something. Nidhi, Nidhi is in the house. Nidhi, you should say something. 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 Nidhi, Nidhi is running. Nidhi, 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 Nidhi. Not only inside the house, but also outside the house, the commotion is taking place. Now the BJP workers have gathered here. They are now saying that our uh, party workers are not letting the uh, nominated council member to take oath. Um, on the other side, our um, party is claiming that um, their leader, uh, their members uh, are not being allowed to take oath. So, allegations versus counter allegations are taking place. Um. India is number one manufacturer of two wheelers in the world. Number one also in tractors. Number two in buses. Number three in trucks. Number four in passenger vehicles. And very shortly we will be number three overtaking Japan. Just wait for a couple of years. I've told that you've taken some 800 acres. You are investing some 20,000 or 18,000 crore rupees in a Haryana plant. Kar so you're also preparing for the future. Yeah. That shows your commitment. Its capacity is one million cars annually. So this is going to one be... One of the largest in the world. Not one of the largest. It is the largest. Republic, 45.7%. Republic TV has 331% more viewership than News 18 in Super Prime Time. Content supremacy destroys the landing experiment. Nidhi, 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 
Shankar Shekhar Mishra, the accused in this uh, particular cases. We are also getting to learn that uh, just a few days ago after the incident, uh, Shankar Mishra, the accused, being identified as the Vice President of Wells Fargo. This is the Wells Fargo office uh, where uh, the accused, uh, Shankar Mishra, works out from. And uh, a few of the employees too, when we did speak to them off the record, they clearly stated that they know him but uh, they do not know or they are not aware of whether he is here or not. I'm, I'm ringing the bell. We'll try to check if he's there inside. If if he re responds uh, to the question of Republic TV, Mr. Mishra, if, if you can hear me, could you just respond? Are you apologetic? Are you sorry for the thing that happened on the Air India flight, Mr. Mishra? Can you open the door and respond to the questions of Republic TV? I would argue that the that the that the political that the political epicenter of a of of a of a forward looking Indian independence movement started with Bal Gangadhar Tilak, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai and Bipin Chandra Pal. But Lal Bal Pal have also been undermined. Absolutely. They they've almost, the they, they've been made a they've been made a side chapter. No, no, they were told that they're the extremists. Why, so, why extremist? Was it extremist? Nothing extreme about what they were asking. They were just asking for freedom. No, they were asking. Which is a reasonable thing to ask for. And they were nationalists. Absolutely. So, so the loyalists at that time were going, I mean, after a lot of cajoling, finally in the late 20s, the, 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 they began to ask for some dominion status. By which point the uh, revolutionaries had moved on and created a constitution for the Hindustan Republican Association asking for a democratic republic Absolutely. Uh, with uh, universal suffrage. So, so the, the role of the Hindustan Republican Association, which Bhagat Singh actually wanted to rename as the Hindustan Republican Socialist Association. He did actually, after Sachin Sanyal was sent to jail. After yeah. Sachin Sanyal was sent yeah. to jail, but his, but his proposal was rejected in one of the initial meetings when he was also very young. But, but the role of the Hindustan Republican Association or the Hindustan Republican Socialist Association hmm. in actually demanding full freedom, hmm. universal suffrage, equality before the law, and, and for all citizens has never been written about Absolutely. in any history book. So We've not even seen a real mention of the Hindustan Republican Socialist Association. Do you realize the kind of crime that has been committed in the name of writing history? So absolutely, both the HRA and the HSRA <laughs> are barely mentioned. Uh, whereas they were imp very important uh, characters of that time. In fact, there are debates in Young India between Sachinath Sanyal and uh, uh, Gandhi, which were published as part of the debates of that time. So they were really a part of the national debate of that time. And, and a generation before that, Bande Mataram, Karma Yogi with Aurobindo and others writing. So these were all very well-known national figures. Um, the debates of the time involved these revolutionaries and yet we have quietly deleted them and kind of you'll get one small paragraph talking about the India, uh, INA at best uh, and then everything else is about the Morley Minto reforms and so on. Okay. Uh, uh, one other point, you know, these people who call themselves left liberal. I always say there can be nothing called left liberal, the biggest oxymoron because a leftist can never be liberal and those who are liberal can never be leftist. But the left liberals, quote unquote left liberals, have completely removed any element of revolutionary Marxist influence in our freedom struggle. Uh, that does not just end but it begins with the complete alienation or elimination of Bhagat Singh. Uh, from the writing of the history of India. Why is that so? Why has the role well, of, the, of the leftists been undermined? Many of whom had tremendous sacrifices, went underground. Were they also perceived to be a threat? Well, uh, in the specific case of uh, Bhagat Singh, Bhagat actually Singh. he has been in some ways built up by the left as uh, their contribution to the freedom struggle. But in fact, uh, Bhagat Singh was a part of a movement which was almost entirely nationalist. Yes. Um, his uh, sort of guru, so to speak, was Sachindranath Sanyal, Sachindra who was clearly anti-Marxist. Yes. And he himself in his uh, text writes, uh, why I'm an atheist, he mentions that uh, uh, almost everybody else is not a, 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 a Marxist. They had to sort of make him kind of the founder of the movement because the actual founder of the movement, who is M. N. Roy, yes. who founded the CPI in Tashkent in 1920, 
he actually drifted off from the uh, mainstream communist movement and therefore became a bit of an embarrassment. So the left had to kind of resurrect uh, Bhagat Singh as kind of their founder, but he was not their founder at all. Even more embarrassingly, the, the, the CPI went and actually supported the British during the Second World War against the INA. Yeah. Um, they, they have more than adequate literature of them mocking, for example, uh, Netaji, yeah. uh, which they will now try to be uh, sort of uh, brush under the carpet. Interestingly, the group that uh, got the probably the largest group of Marxist uh, revolutionaries um, uh, that were there ended up in a party that is now almost forgotten, which is the Revolutionary Socialist Party, RSP. It is today not a very important party, but there was a time when it was a significant presence, particularly in Bengal. Um, and again, that party has uh, more or less frittered away. Um, so that's where it is at. And on the other end of the spectrum, of course, there is the RSS. Yeah. Uh, its founder, Hegdewar, was uh, the head of Anushalan Samiti in Maharashtra. And if you see the way the RSS is set up even today, it's directly derived from Sri Aurobindo's uh, pamphlet called uh, Bhavani, um, uh, Bhavani Mandir, Bhavani Mandir. Uh, where he describes exactly the network of Akhadas, which is what the Shakhas are. So there's an enormous contribution of this movement to even understand India of today. So viewers, if you, if you can look at it, you, what Sanjeev Sanya just said was, unfortunately, we have been looking at our history through the prism of political convenience. A servile history has been written, aimed at basically being a hagiography of the uh, Congress leadership of, of a certain strand. Not that they had no contribution, but of a certain strand that's been overplayed. But in the last two minutes, if you just heard Sanjeev, you would have seen him refer to Bhagat Singh, Sachindranath Sanyal, uh, 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 Aurobindo. Uh, we've spoken about uh, Swami Vivekananda, the intellectual roots, Raj Bihari Bose, uh, Raj Bihari Bose um, uh, uh, Swami Dayanand, uh, you know, the, the Gada rites, and, and it is impossible, impossible for us to even conceive sitting here today that when Sanjeev and I were in college, we never even knew about their contribution and we were told they were simply irritants to the larger non-violent purpose of getting our independence. We've completely we, we, have, we have completely uh, mutilated our history, Sanjeev. Absolutely. We have mutilated our history. And now I want to, you, since you mentioned Aurobindo, and I go back to what we are unfortunately embarrassed about, but which is very relevant. Aurobindo. Fascinating. Fascinating individual here. Aurobindo Ghosh, uh, brought up as an Anglophile, broke away. You know, till a particular point, his father would not even let him read or interact in Bengali in Bengali right and he goes to Britain he, he studies in Cambridge and his story but but at some point of time he rebels against his father and he follows his own heart and it takes him a long time to 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 find his own roots but through Aurobindo I want you to speak a little bit now about the role of Hindu revivalism in our freedom movement and the reason I'm saying this to you is because it's very easily said Oh, the RSS never contributed to India's freedom struggle. It's a sweeping statement which has been made. It is my contention, but you would articulate it better, that there was a significant role of Hindu revivalism in our freedom movement because our Hindu roots can never be separated. Uh, you know, it can never be separated from, uh, from, our, from our history. I'm quoting to you here, Aurobindo Ghosh's uh, Uttarpara speech of 1909 where Aurobindo Ghosh says the following the Hindu nation was born with the Sanatan Dharm with it it moves and with it it grows when the Sanatan Dharm declines and if Sanatan Dharm were capable of perishing with the Sanatan Dharm it will perish the Sanatan Dharm that is nationalism this is the message that I have to speak to you you have also written here that many post-independence historians in an act of misplaced secularism downplay the importance of Hindu revivalism in the freedom movement in general and on the revolutionism in particular. So we are faced with a very strange situation. You have the, these writers of history have completely uh, blacked out the role of, 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 the, of the communists, the Marxists. And they've also completely blacked out the role of the, uh, 
those who come from a Hindu revivalist tradition. Can you expand a little bit on this, the role of Hindu revivalism in our freedom movement? So we discussed earlier about uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda yes. and Dayanand Saraswati and the Arya Samaj and so yes. on. What happens here is you have here a character, Sri Aurobindo or Aurobindo Ghosh as he was known then. Yes. He is faced with this crisis because, particularly because of his father, who was essentially extremely westernized and, you know, what we could maybe even call a collaborationist cl uh, class, which it had developed particularly in Bengal but other parts as well, who had benefited under British rule and, in fact, uh, wanted it to be perpetuated. They had basically become brown sahibs. And so, Sri Aurobindo rebels against this. He refuses to join the civil service even though he passes the, all the exams. And then he comes to Baroda and he begins to build this new narrative. And he becomes quite a passionate Devi worshipper at, at this stage in his life. Okay. He, he wants to set up this uh, uh, Bhavani Mandir uh, to create this network of uh, warrior monks. Mm. And this idea is there everywhere. You see even Savarkar when he starts out he gives a pledge to his uh, temple deity of Bhavani. And you see this same imagery coming through uh, very repeatedly in all the uh, revolutionary uh, um, um, sort of literature, uh, the terminologies they use. Even the song Vande Mataram, other than the first two stanzas, the others have strong amount of Shakti imagery. So this is an important strand of our freedom struggle. It should not be so very surprising because, you know, large majority of Indians are indeed Hindu. Uh, the fact that they consider this uh, this country as their sacred land would not unnaturally have inspired uh, their freedom movement. So, I have no idea why we should be embarrassed about it. It's a factual, um, uh, it, it's just a fa fact of history. And uh, there is absolutely no reason to be uh, downplaying it at all. In fact, you have said, you've said also in the same page you write that uh, uh, the, many of the views held by the likes of Tilak, Savarkar and Bismil mark them out as Hindu nationalists. But readers should remember that their most trusted lieutenants were non-Hindus. John Baptista, Madam Bikaji Kama or Ashwakulla Khan. And you go on to say that basically the unapologetic Hindu identity of Tilak and Savarkar does not make them bigots. Absolutely. And that's a learning for the times. Absolutely. For example... So the stereotyping which is going on right now mm. in social media, elsewhere, by people who do not go into depth, is terrible. In fact, I think, I think when I read your book, that that made them a bigger threat. Absolutely. To, to the British. Because were, the fact they that they, flexible. They, they brought everyone together. Yes. So Sachindranath Sanyal is an inspiration for Bhagat Singh. Now today, oh my God, how can somebody who belongs ideologically what we would today call to the right have inspired somebody from the left? Well, they would have probably laughed at this argument uh, in the first place. Uh, Netaji, for example, was uh, very much inspired by uh, Shaktism, uh, but you know, he sort of, oh, but he belongs to the left. Uh, yes, he did, but he was also a big Durga Bhakt yeah. and uh, inspired by Swami Vivekanand. So, the, today's uh, way of splintering all these people and trying to diminish them into these uh, boxes is absolutely in fact, wrong. that's the whole Indian identity. That's Bharatiyata. We soak in every tradition. We, we bring in the best of all the absolutely. traditions. Our Hindu philosophy. We, 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 we learn about Irish nationalism. We talk about, uh, we talk about the, the Russian revolution of 1917. We take the best ideas and we bring them into our own context. But that's not the way in which this has been written. One point here. Page 34, you very interestingly quote, uh, take a few more minutes here. You say that, uh, you know, when, um, I think this is your reference to, um, uh, where you're writing in great detail to the support that Sayaji Gaikwad gave to um, uh, Sri Aurobindo. Sri Aurobindo. And uh, you talk about how the Delhi Darbar happened at that point of time and Sayaji Rao Gaikwad was very careful to support Aurobindo but not be seen to be overtly supporting Aurobindo because he had to play a little bit of a you know, middle role. Yes. Uh, he, he couldn't go fall completely foul yes. of the British. So he went to the Delhi Darbar of 1911 when, when George V, I think, uh, was, uh, was, was, was visiting India. But when he went up to the dais, he, he, there was a single perfunctory bow. Then he walks back and he, he, he shows his back to the emperor. He's forced to write a letter of apology, uh, you know, but it was an act of defiance, I think, well thought out by Sayaji Rao Gaikwad. But Motilal Nehru, who was a witness to the event, was very upset at Sayaji Rao Gaikwad. 
which which gives me a feeling that motilal nehru in 1911 unlike what the nehru gandhi family nehru gandhi wadra family as i described them would like us to believe was was quite servile himself to the british and he says to jawaharlal he says i'm sorry to say that gaikwad has fallen from the high pedestal he once occupied in public estimation absolutely so motilal nehru was certainly not happy about what gaikwad did at the delhi darbar uh, and uh, yes, Motilal Nehru did belong to what would be called the loyalist faction. But to be fair to him, uh, there were periods in his life where he also did support the revolutionaries, for example, in the 20s when he was in the Swarajist faction as well. So I can argue that that was convenient at that point of time. Maybe. But the fact is that he was no doubt about it that Motilal Nehru was a politician of his time. He was playing to whatever happened to be the audience that he was. He belonged to the moderate faction. Later on, he joined the Swarajas, who had derived from the Tilak's faction, the Lal Bal Pal faction, and so on. And uh, at, at times, he did support the uh, revolutionaries as well. But yes, at that particular instant, there is no doubt that he was a loyalist. Let's have a transparent reading of history. Can I ask you some, uh, a question here right now. Mm. First of all, uh, Sanjeev, why does the lobby hate you? Uh, you, know, you know, they say, why does Sanjeev Sanyal need to get into this? He's well, an economist, he's been a banker, he's worked with a global MNC bank, he's in the government. They're okay with it, they tolerate you up to that point. When you get into history, they savagely attack you. And they say you are an interloper, you do not have a PhD in history, you do not have academic credentials in history, and therefore you should keep your mouth shut. Well, uh, <laughs> I probably get attacked quite a lot on my economics as well. But yes, uh, it is very often brought up that I am not a trained historian. But my view is, I have never claimed to be a trained historian. And there are many instances in many other fields where uh, cha big changes have happened because of outsiders. I mean, for example, the physics was completely transformed by Einstein, who was not a professor, but a uh, patent office clerk when he made all those big changes. So, outsiders have always changed uh, fields, but what happens here, I think, is that I am beginning to question some very long cherished mythologies uh, that were created after, particularly after independence. Uh, by eliminating from the story other, other narratives, for example, those of R.C. Mazumdar or Jadunath Sarkar and others. And I am very inconveniently bringing some of this back into the conversation. Um, and in fact, adding some of my uh, ideas as well along the way, whether it's in terms of maritime history or, uh, or the origins of Indian civilization from the Saraswati and so on. And I feel that uh, that is definitely threatening to many many academic careers. But academic history is in one place when popular history sometimes becomes more relevant. And yours, the, what you write here is popular history. This book is an easy read. Uh, it has all the academic footnotes, but at the end of the day, it is something which every Indian can read and probably should read. Maybe that makes you a bigger threat. Perhaps that is the will case. Will you pull back? <laughs> I will not pull back. I have many other books in my head. Um, some of them are not in history. They're in other fields, including economics. Um, so, you know, I will, I will keep at it. Do you think it's the intellectual depth of the new right in this country, represented by people like you, or, or a Vikram Sampath, uh, or maybe in the world of business, a Mohandas Pai? Arguments which are not just, uh, you know, fleeting arguments, but which are backed up with fact, uh, a fair amount of research, and original thinking which proved to be a bigger threat to, to these people who have been holding the establishment for the last 70 years and they see that as a potent threat. Hence, there was also an attack on Vikram Sampath, a pretty savage attack at the same time. Yes, so, you know, in, India's uh, intellectual world has been dominated by uh, two versions of the left, the Marxist left and the Nehruvian left for a very, very long time. And even after 1991 reforms, the intellectual space continued to be dominated by them, even if the rest of the economy and society changed. What, we, what you're seeing now is a challenge by the non-left uh, through, of course, this is a book of history, but you also see that in, in the field of economics and sociology and other fields, or, uh, or even for that matter, in, in international relations, uh, other ideas now beginning to knock on the door. And uh, I'm not surprised that the incumbents uh, will feel threatened by that. I, do you think our economic, last question, since you have been a macroeconomics uh, student and practitioner for most of your career, do you think as our economic cloud grows, our, our, our awareness of the depth of our Indic civilization uh, needs to grow and awareness of it needs to grow, 
uh, to really achieve what the Prime Minister speaks about. Absolutely. Uh, being a developed nation. We can't just be developed economically and not Absolutely. in terms of self-awareness. So every civilization digs deep during its period of revival. I mean, you look at the Europeans, they dug back to the classical period when they went through the Renaissance. Um, the, the Chinese are currently rediscovering a lot of their own history as they emerge. I mean, whether you like their belligerence on international affairs is a different matter. Yeah. But certainly their revival is heavily dependent on understanding their own history in their own terms. Yeah. And our own revival as we are going through it will be based on a better understanding from our own lens of our own history. And I think that is an absolutely important ingredient in the story. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Sanjeev. I have really enjoyed this. I've enjoyed catching up with you. I, you. I truly wish you and, and scholars uh, like you all the very best. And I'm openly plugging for your book, which I never do. <laughs> and HarperCollins, you know, this is a paid advertisement for them. But, but The Revolutionaries by Sanjeev Sanya, ladies and gentlemen, your weekend read, your, uh, your month's read or your week's read. Don't, uh, don't miss this one. Thank you very much. Sanjeev, good meeting you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.